everyone. Thanks for joining. I'm Claire Longo. I'm head of customer success here at Arise. Um, and thanks for joining us at Arise Observed Unstructured. We're going to be doing a casual fireside chat here with Maxime Boisen joining us from Labelbox. Um, as we go through this chat, please uh, drop your questions in our chat box and also in our community uh, Slack channel. We'll be monitoring that as well. Um, and we'll get to your questions as we go. All right, well, let's jump in. Uh, Maxime, thanks for joining us. I want to start by um, getting an introduction. Your background is really interesting. Can you tell us a little bit about your background and what you're working on today? Hey, Claire, thanks for having me here. Very happy to, to be here. Um, I So a little bit about my background. I grew up in Europe, in France, um, did a ton of science, math, physics, computer science as a kid. And I kind of fell in the world of deep learning in 2016 uh, at Stanford, where every single one uh, in that area was uh, talking about deep learning all day long. And I kind of got fascinated by this field and started writing papers in some labs. Um, so in Andrew Ng's AI lab, um, which is a really cool lab doing medical um, AI, uh, the computer vision lab of Stanford, and uh, a, few, uh, a few other labs. Um, and that research was fascinating. During the summers, I would uh, join some machine learning teams at Apple or the Taiku. And after a few years of doing this research, I uh, decided that I might try to start my own company and try to bring you know, AI in uh, production and actual products and started a, a, you know, a, a startup to bring a, a better news curation to, to young people, especially. And turns out we had a, a really cool product, but it was a terrible business. Um, I would never start that company again, uh, but it was fun, a ton of learnings. And um, you know, we shut down the company after uh, uh, two years and, and now I joined the label box um, in product and I'm leading uh, our efforts to make label box you know, a great product to um, um, understand, explore your, your data and go through those data centric iterations that we'll uh, talk about today. Awesome. Yeah, that's an amazing, amazing story. Um, tell us a little bit more about Labelbox. I'm, I'm sure the audience would want to hear a little bit more about what Labelbox does, how it brings value to the ML lifecycle, and um, we'd love to see a quick demo. So at Labelbox, we're really focused on unstructured data. So that's images, videos, text, medical data. Um, geospatial data, basically everything that you just cannot put in a table. And our goal is to help uh, ML teams label this data. That's where name origin came from, Labelbox. And um, uh, then we grew into a training data platform. So it's basically a place where you can not only label your data, but go through those data centric iterations and make these smart de decisions about what to label next as you're developing your machine learning models. Um, and so we're really built around the ability to annotate data, to manage the labelers and the people and the processes around labeling, and the ability to iterate and improve um, your training data. Amazing. Um, can we see a quick demo? Yep, we're happy to uh, show you a quick demo. All right, so I will start by showing you the labeling part of Labelbox. So Labelbox is structured, uh, you know, we have a couple products and here I'm in the labeling part of the product. And um, um, this was a labeling project we started labeling uh, this month. It's the Coco dataset. And um, as you can see, we have some labeled data already. It says 16,000 images. And we have some data and you can see these bounding boxes um, with um, a couple of annotations uh, um, on every image. And there is um, data that still needs to be labeled. Um, so like these 3000 um, images. And you know, I can look at it and I can just hit that start labeling to um, uh, and, and then create um, you know, the the, the, the annotations, in this case, it's bounding boxes that uh, I actually care about. And you know, once I'm happy with them, I can hit this uh, submit button and uh, move on to the next image, et cetera, et cetera. I can set up a ton of things so that people can uh, you know, review what I've just labeled. Um, 
And this is really the, the first step of any machine learning project, which is starting by labeling a bunch of data. And then what it gets uh, interesting is when, um, uh, you know, I've labeled that data, I can export it outside of label box, uh, you know, by hitting this export button here. And once I export it outside of label box, I can split it into a training set, a validation set, a test set, and I can uh, train an actual machine learning model. And then I can upload all my model predictions, metrics, confidence scores, anything model related to this uh, models part of Labelbox. And here I'm going to show you, um, you know, a model that I trained a few days ago on this Coco data set. And uh, you'll see that I can, uh, I see the same images as before. And in green, I have my annotations from uh, before. Um, but now in red, we actually see uh, the predictions. And so my model was really good at detecting some of these cars um, and some of these people. Um, and I can qualitatively inspect uh, you know, that, that model while I'm developing it to get a sense of you know, it, how well is it performing? Well, where is it performing well? Where is it performing poorly? And I can look at that qualitatively, but also quantitatively. And so I have all these graphs and, and confusion matrices to see you know, the confidence uh, of my model predictions, the F1 score, the IOUs, the precision, the recall, and all these metrics we compute for you. And where it gets a bit funny is you know, if I, uh, you know, I realize that uh, my model might not be performing this well on bananas. And so I just you know, click here and I'm able to surface all the data rows where my model is um, uh, performing poorly on bananas. And just by visualizing this, you know, inspecting this manually, I, I realized that my yeah. model is going completely crazy because it's predicting every single banana. Whereas the ground truth in green uh, is just like the whole bunch of bananas. So of course, like my model's terrible in terms of metrics. And that's like a failure mode. I can, you know, I can confirm it on other, some other um, data images that I see here. And, you know, I can select them and I can decide you know, that this is a failure mode I absolutely want to fix. And so what I'm going to do is I'm going to open them in this third part of our product called catalog. And I'm going to look for similar data rows because basically I want to find similar data rows that are not labeled yet. And I want to label that in priority in order to fix that failure mode so that when I retrain a model on all these additional images of bananas, uh, it's going to perform um, uh, better and hopefully not suffer from these failure modes we've just seen. So I'm just creating this like many bananas uh, uh, function, basically trying to find more bananas among all my data sitting on all my buckets across all my cloud providers. And then I just come in here and you know ask to retrieve all my many bananas. And I can control you know to keep only images that really look like bananas. And I can ask to keep data rows that are not labeled yet as uh, bananas. So these are images that look like bananas, but that are not labeled yet as bananas. And I can, uh, you know, just like select, select a bunch of those. And, you know, any ones I care about that I find relevant. And I can actually send that to a labeling project called uh, you know, maybe my fruit labeling project. And I will ask this to be labeled in priority to fix uh, my model banana issue. Uh, and I can give that a high priority. And you know, in two days, once this is labeled, I can, uh, so again, this is being sent to my labeling project. And I can, uh, in two days, uh, begin to, um, uh, once this is labeled, I can actually export that data again, train a new model, hopefully see it's not, uh, you know, it doesn't have the same failure modes and, uh, uh, you know, from there take other, another data centric iteration to improve my, my model. Yeah, this is great. It's providing a very seamless uh, feedback loop between the model training and the data improvement, um, allowing you to like improve your data quality in a very targeted and informed way. It's really cool to see. Thanks for the demo. I wanna jump into some other questions about Labelbox. Um, you talk a lot about improving model performance with less data. Can you tell me a little bit about the workflow for improving model performance with less data during specifically the model training phase? 
what can you be what can we really be done there to reduce um, data costs yeah so one um thanks for pointing out this distinction i think there are really two different parts in in the ml project or two different phases phase one the one you refer to is when you know ml teams are iterating their models before they reach production. And here it's really about trying to reach a certain performance, a level of performance, so that the model can be deployed in production. And then there's a whole different world once the model is actually in production. And so, um, you know, how can we improve uh, model performance with less data in that first phase while the model is not yet in production? Um, and maybe before, you know, sharing some of the best practices we're seeing in that field or sharing. Uh, you know, um, how we see uh, some of our customers do that really successfully. Uh, I just want to, you know, spend a second on the why. Like, why do you care? Why would ML teams care about uh, labeling uh, less data, being more efficient in terms of what should they label in priority to improve their model performance? And the answer is actually pretty, um, pretty simple. And um, it, it, it's that today, most ML teams are confronted to way too much unlabeled data. Uh, there is abundant and labeled data, and it's impossible to label everything. And you, know, you could go in and, and pick some data at random. And, but that would take like an infinite amount of time. And, um, you know, you would ultimately, more, more data is, would lead to better performance, um, but you would reach better performance much faster if you made really targeted and smart decisions around what to label. Um, and, and some of this, you know, high value high impact data that you absolutely want to identify and focus on is, for instance, surfacing all your corrupted data. This is data you actually want to remove from your, uh, from your data sets because it's undermining your model performance. Another example is like surfacing um, really difficult data on which your model is struggling uh, or really rare data that your model doesn't see that often. And, and this, you absolutely want to surface them and find you know, similar data points and label that in priority. Another example is um, finding surfacing data that's been poorly labeled. So like, uh, it's pretty common that labelers, um, even though they do their best, um, you know, they end up introducing some bias or some errors in the labels. And, and this is something you actually want to catch and fix um, because same thing, this undermines your machine learning model. And last example is like redundant data. Like having a ton of redundant data labeled is not hurtful to your model, um, is just a waste of resources. And so everything where, you know, what is labeling less data? It's trying to identify all these different types of data and either double down on it or remove it or fix it. Um, and we kind of see, you know, one best practice here. Um, and, and, and frankly, the, the, the only way to do that is to proceed in iterations. So when you're developing your model, um, you know, there used to be a world where you would label a ton of data and then move on to your model development phase. And yeah. here, really, the key is to, like, you know, start by labeling a small batch of data, train a first model on it, and then use your uh, model as an oracle to decide what to label next. And you can use that to, you know, label an additional small batch of data, retrain a new model, and use that as a new oracle to decide what to label next. And going through these iterations and that loop is going to help you um, label as little data as possible, but as often as possible. And so there are th really three techniques that stand out and that we see strong ML teams using um, to do that um, and identify the data I've mentioned before. So number one is active learning. Mm -hmm. um, and active learning basically answers the following question. Like, I have a ton of unlab unlabeled data. It's not labeled. And it's sitting on some buckets. Um, what should I label among that? And the two really, um, you know, um, the two high-level answers to that is um, label the data where your model is, is not confident, where your model is like uncertain. So you know your data is unlabeled. It's sitting on a bucket. You can deploy your, you can make your model, um, you can make your model predict on that unlabeled data and identify the data with the lowest confidence scores. And that's typically data that you want to label in priority because that's where your model is uncertain. And number two for active learning is uh, focusing on out of distribution data. So like I have a model um, um, that's been trained on some training data and I want to identify 
among all my unlabeled data, um, if I look at the, at the embeddings, at the distribution of that data, I might realize that some images are really redundant mm -hmm. and, and are distributed in the same way as my training data, but some images are really new. They're in, they're, they, they, they don't look like my training data. And embeddings is a really powerful way to do that. And so finding that out of distribution data is a way of um, deciding what to label among all my unlabeled data. So that's like active learning number one. That's like um, you know a, a really powerful best practice that teams use um, while they're iterating on their models before they reach production. And then number two is error analysis. So that's more focused on the on the small section of data that's labeled. Um, you know you can use your model on that small uh, section of data that's labeled to get some insights about what to label next. And so for instance. Um, you know, you can look at the discrepancies between your model predictions and your actual labels, um, ground truth labels. And whenever they disagree, that's really insightful because it could be just one of two things. Possibly number one is that the model is wrong and the labels are correct. And in that case, you know, you found a failure mode. Maybe my model is struggling on like pink cars. And in that case, I absolutely want to find more similar pink cars. And for that, I can use embeddings and see where those pink cars are, are sitting in my embedding space and find more pink cars using that like embedding similarity search. Um, but I absolutely want to find more pink cars because my model's struggling on it. Um, it might be the case that the model is, you know, the model could be wrong and the labels are right, but it could be the other way around as well. Like maybe my model is wrong Sorry, my model is actually right, and my labels are wrong. Um, you know, in the banana example earlier, you could argue my model was actually correct, and maybe the labelers got a little bit lazy and just annotated the bunch of bananas instead of annotating each banana individually. Right. And uh, you know, this is actually a great like using your model predictions, like we just did in in the demo, to identify where there's a discrepancy, uh, and where you know my model is like super confident but it completely disagrees with the, the ground truth, that's where typically a, a way to surface labeling errors. And so you can surface labeling errors and fix those using this kind of error analysis uh, just described. And so at a high level, you know, taking a step back, active learning, error analysis, two of the biggest workflows um, or, or, or you know, kind of data iterations you can go through while your model is in, in development to decide what to label what in priority in your next batch. That is really cool to hear. Um, I honestly, I wish I had this tool back in the day when I was working on a labeled data project, because I did exactly what you mentioned is I labeled like all the data, just as much data as we could, and then went to train the model, but there was no iterative, like targeted cycle in labeling that data. So this is really cool to see. It's very, very useful. Um, let's move on to talk about production um, quickly when you, when you've, um, once you've decided you have a good model and you put it into production, it's live, it's serving maybe real time or batch predictions being consumed by a business and relied on, um, what can be done there to improve the quality over time in terms of data labeling? Yeah, so once you graduate from like the first phase, which is developing, iterating on my machine learning model and you're actually pushing it to production. So it's really interesting if some things really don't change and some things absolutely change. So like starting with the things that don't change, it's actually a lot of the same mechanisms and best practices and techniques. Um, uh, sorry, so taking a step back, like even when your model's in production, you absolutely want to keep improving it. Number one, because you want to deliver a better service, um, but number two, because the world is changing. And so the, the data it gets confronted to uh, typically changes. It might be at a very small time scale or very long time scale but the data distribution is gonna change at some point and you'll want to update your model to reflect that. And so you, 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 even in production, there's this need to identify, to keep retraining my model and therefore to identify what I should label next to retrain my model in the most efficient and powerful way that's gonna improve model performance as much as possible. So that need still exists. And the techniques that are used are actually uh, a lot of the same. So, you know, my model in production gets confronted to a ton of data. I'm still interested in, in surfacing the low confidence predictions where my model is really uncertain. That's right. still valid. And that's still a good idea of data to label. 
Another example is uh, out of distribution data. Oh, you know, this week I woke up, I looked at my dashboard and realized that the distribution of the data uh, uh, my model was confronted to in production uh, was actually different from the previous week or from six months ago. Um, that's still, and, and, and most importantly, very different from the training distribution. Yep. That's a, a fantastic insight. And you absolutely want to bring those data points um, um, to your labeling team in priority. So a lot of, and same thing, you know, you might let, you might label a random subset of your production data, and then you can use those like error analysis techniques we've been describing to decide where you need to make some targeting improvements. So like a lot of these techniques are actually the same. However, there are a few things that change completely. And, 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 you know, that's like, uh, uh, uh kind of going from like a, a, a project, uh, uh, you know, that can be a one man team or a few people team to actually a project that requires a lot more tooling right. and bigger teams to support it. And that's mostly for two reasons. So like what changes is that um, you're confronted to constant stream of data. So, you know, when you're training your model, you typically have a fixed data set and maybe you can collect more data, but it's gonna arrive in like fixed batches you know, that you control the time, like the time at which, uh, or the timing at which your data is coming, you can leave it on the side and it's not going to grow. Like the, the, your, most of your training data is actually, uh, uh, you know, nicely controlled, sitting on a bucket, static and, 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 and easy to manage. When your models are in production, it's the entire opposite. You're facing a constant stream of data because your models are making predictions all day long um, and, and that blows up really fast. Yep. Um, and, and, um, you know, you can't do things manually anymore. And so it's not only, it's like a constant stream of data, but it's a massive stream of data. And so same thing, uh, you know, you need a lot more focus on like the data pipelines yep. and you need data engineers and like uh, the, the whole tooling engineering of like where the data is coming from, where you dump them, what you decide to select, um, uh, to label in priority, all of that needs to be more and more automatic and at scale. Um, and that's, I think, the biggest difference we're seeing, uh, you know, in the field, where a lot of these early phases projects are one to two to three people team project. And then you actually need to diversify the skills, especially around data engineering and data pipelines to support that constant stream. So that's the major number one difference. The number two difference is you need to be alerted if something goes wrong. You know, while I'm developing my machine learning model, if something goes wrong, nobody cares. Once the model's in production, you know, if something goes wrong, I absolutely want to be alerted. And, and you know, many things could go wrong. Like, you know, databases could crash, the data distribution might change, uh, maybe my model suddenly behaves weirdly and makes weird predictions. Um, there's like, uh, uh, maybe my data pre-processing starts working. Um, and, and so you need to monitor every single piece of your system uh, and monitor the drift in the data, monitor the drift in your predictions, monitor the state of your different steps of your pipelines, and, you know, be, be able to send alerts when something goes wrong, basically. Totally agree with all that. We've seen a lot of things go wrong with models in production. I have myself through my career, and it's exactly what you're saying. It's all about automation and um, scaling it up. Very cool. Not the easiest part. <laughs> not the easiest part of a machine learning no, project. Not. Um, cool. So tell me a little bit about how how do you troubleshoot to determine when you need to do additional labeling? What's the best practices around that? Yeah. So when to do additional labeling? I think it's slightly different for again, you know, like these two phases of the project when you're like developing your machine learning system. And when you're in production, when your model's in production. So like, if we start with like, when you're developing your model um, and going through those iterations, I think here, you know, the, the best practice we've seen is to set a North Star metric. Um, and, you know, when I reach this performance, um, I'm happy and I ship my model to production mode and um, I, 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 I stop, I graduate basically from this development mode to production mode. And as long as I don't reach that performance, that level of performance, I have to iterate on my model and my data to keep improving it. And so back to your question, you know, uh, you know, what do I know, you know, when should I improve my model? When should I improve my 
data? When should I approve my labeling? Like, you know, what should I do? I think what we're seeing, um, you know, one rule of thumb we're seeing is that, you know, we're still in a world where more data is going to improve your model performance. Mm -hmm. And so if you can make that, you know, decision to decide what to label in a really smart way, you're going to improve your model performance way faster. And that's great. But we're still in a system where we're still in a world where, you know, um, model architecture, you know, uh, you might iterate on it in the early phases, but at some point it's probably going to be fixed. There aren't that many architect model architectures. Yeah. And then it's all about going from like a model centric approach to a data centric approach and, you know, focusing most of your effort on improving the data. And when you're improving the data, you know, it, it turns out that there aren't that many things you can do. You can like fix labels or label more. So you have to be really smart around what you label, you know, with some of the techniques we've mentioned before. But, you know, most of the time the answer is like, you know, label more, or fix the labels and but identify those in a smart way. And so, you know, when do you decide you should label more? Well, basically, whenever you haven't reached your model uh, performance, um, uh, you know, you'll probably have to label more to, to get there. Um, but you have to be, you know, really smart around what to label um, uh, using some of these techniques. Um, I think when models are in production, uh, you know, that's where, um, uh, and, and so, you know, sorry, um, continuing that topic of like models in development, um, I think here you can be like really pragmatic and, and you know, we're, you know, we're seeing customers being really pragmatic where they would almost like randomly go through an active learning loop and then, you know, and decide to label more data from their unlabeled bucket of data that's sitting somewhere. And then, you know, two days later, they'll go through an error analysis loop to try to find and fix model failures. And, you know, they, they'll identify the model struggling on pink cars, collect more data, fix it. And then they'll do a, a, an iteration of uh, two days later, they'll do an iteration of error analysis to surface uh, label errors. So like, oh, uh, my labeling got uh, made a mistake, you know, uh, let me surface it and, 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 uh, um, and fix that. And then it's, they're just being really pragmatic around like, you know, diminishing returns. It's like, oh, you know, uh, we realized that today we're getting more performance boost from like active learning. So we might do a, a few more of those loops and then that's gonna plateau a little bit. And then, you know, they'll, they'll do a little bit of, uh, uh, they'll do more error analysis, uh, same thing that's gonna give a performance boost until it plateaus and kind of like being really scrappy and, and iterative around like, oh, you know, and, and pragmatic around like this gave a boost let's continue, this didn't, let's try something else. Yeah. In practice is what uh, we've seen working really well. And then when models are in production, that's a, a little bit of a different story. And I think you might have more insights uh, at Arise than uh, uh, maybe us. Um, but the, the, you, you have a few more, you know, in pr when your model's in production, you have a few more, um, let's say reasons to label more data. And you know, that could be something as simple as like user feedback. Right. Like, you know, users start complaining, I need to improve my model. And, you know, in a lot of cases, that's going to be through labeling more data in a smart way, like smart, deciding smartly which data, but it's going to end up labeling more data. Um, it might be through your alerts that we've described, you know, like a, a data drift or prediction drift. Um, that's going to lead me to label more data. It might be something as simple as like the, 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 the macro context changing. Like, you know, during COVID, a lot of these predictive models just got, you know, crazy and uh, you know you didn't have to wait for the system to go crazy you can anticipate that yes. and um, decide proactively to label more recent data to adapt to these uh, new uh, uh, distributions um, definitely that is um, all the things that we've seen in production and um, yeah responding to that with an automated feedback loop automatically detecting things like drift um, and then being able to take action on that is really powerful Cool. Well, to wrap up, I want to talk a little bit about the labeling space. I know it's grown a lot over the past years. Um, what are some trends that you're seeing in this area? Yeah, so, so many trends, so many trends. I'll try to keep it to uh, uh, two to three. Um, number one, I think the, the, the big trend we've seen um, is the one we've been talking about. So like this data centric, uh, moving from like model centric to data centric AI. And you know, uh, most of our customers, even customers, you know, who you could argue are not like the, the most state-of-the-art AI teams are doing that shift. And, and, and I think that's like a major paradigm shift. 
And um, of course, that has a huge impact in, on labeling because it completely changes the way you, 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 you run your labeling operations. And so it's like picking the right data and not just more data. Um, but a few other trends outside of this one, um, I think that the nature of labeling uh, is changing. It used to be super low level. So the nature of labeling is changing. Like it used to be super low level uh, labeling with like bounding boxes and drawing pixels and drawing segmentation masks. And we're seeing more and more, and it's still the very beginning of this, but I think this is a trend that's gonna come pretty soon. There's, you know, like labeling is getting higher level basically. So I might not need to draw that many bounding boxes anymore because I can just like use an off the shelf model from Hugging Face or from OpenAI to pre-label a ton of my data. And yeah. then I'm not, I don't have to draw these bounding boxes anymore. I simply have to review them and sanity check that you know the model has done a decent job and correct it from time to time. That's like one. Another example of like labeling getting higher level is the focus that you know we're now seeing on not on the bounding boxes, but the, the, the labeling operations. So like I have a team of labelers and I need to make sure that they are um, uh, all labeling in a consistent way. And so the focus on like labeling instructions and uh, consensus between different labelers uh, where you know you're not operating on um, can, can you hear me I'm cutting a little bit no it's still coming okay. through okay perfect it's starting to slow down um, <laughs> yeah no I'm uh, perfect if it's coming through um, we can so you know they, they, there's this high um, so there's this shift towards like from one labeler to like an entire labeling operation. And so like, how do I coordinate several labelers? Um, how do I make sure they're consistent? So a lot of focus on these like labeling instructions, labeling guides, um, a, a lot of focus on detecting labeling mistakes that used to be less the case and consensus, you know, how to make sure that different labelers, when they disagree, how do they handle that? Um, and that's something we didn't see that much um, in the past and we're seeing more and more. And, uh, you know, finally, uh, just the, like, uh, um, uh, the, the, the sheer amount of labeling and compute that that's like, you know, we're still in this exponential phase where every right. single machine, you know, labels, uh, you know, five X more data than two years ago or 10 X more data than two. That's like, and that, you know, open AI, Google, uh, Facebook, all these teams, you know, with, where they're pushing, uh, you know, the state of the art, um, they're just you know, proving that more data, more compute, more labeling actually keeps delivering exponential benefit. Okay, so before we close, can you share some thoughts of, um, about what's coming down the road for Labelbox? What are the latest initiatives that you're focusing on? Okay, great. So before we close, can you share some more thoughts about what's down the road for Labelbox? What are the latest initiatives that you're focusing on right now? Absolutely. So two exciting uh, initiatives were around, you know, labeling automation, basically. So number one is, you know, what we've just described, being able to bring in off the shelf models that, um, you know, uh, uh, work really well on many use cases and being able in just one click to use it to, to, to pre-label my data. And, you know, that's sort of, some people call that noise labeling or weak basically able to leverage have already been trained on labeled data to pre-label in just one click. And that data enrichment is super powerful to speed up labeling, but also to like explore, visualize, query my data. For instance, you know, uh, say you have like videos, streams, massive streams of videos. If I'm able to bring an off-the-shelf model from Google that can automatically detect people in these videos, then I can actually search, uh, you know, for, on the, for the frames that contain more than five people. And maybe those are frames I actually care about and that I want to focus on in, in priority. And so being able to bring that knowledge that exists in off the shelf models to enrich my data and then query it and decide what to focus on is, uh, you know, something we're, we're, we're putting a lot of efforts in and that's really interesting. And number two is just like labeling automation. Like, you know, 
These bounding boxes, they're really strong segmentation models out there. They're really strong prediction models out there. You know, if we're able to augment labelers such that they don't have to actually draw pixel by pixel segmentation mask, but they can just like draw a bounding box and it snaps really fast and, and, and really accurately, that's like a major step forward. And, you know, the getting the details of that right, where it's working not just on like toy data, uh, but on actual real life data with all the noise and the weird distributions that implies uh, is actually trickier than, uh, you know, what we might expect from the outside. And so getting those details right is, um, uh, you know, a big focus at, at LabelX. Great. That sounds like really exciting stuff. Well, thank you so much for joining us. It was really great chatting with you. And thank you to the audience. And we'll check the chat and the Slack uh, for questions. Thanks, everyone. Mm -hmm.